today we're going to build a house for an owl. So there's a few different types of owls in Britain and they're arranged into two families. The first of which is the true owls, which is most of them. You have the tawny or brown owls, which makes a famous twit to woo sound, which is actually a call and response between the male and females. Like most owls, they're very territorial, so young will sometimes starve if they leave the parent's nest and can't find a vacant territory. And they have a slightly spooky cultural connotation because of their call, which is heard at night. Next we have little owls, which were introduced in 1879 in Kent. These are quite happy on farmland, but are pretty versatile when it comes to habitat and can live in places without trees. They're territorial, but not entirely nocturnal, so they can be seen in the day and can get very used to human activity. Here's one my grandfather photographed on one of our pastures in September 2008. Long-eared owls are very stealthy. They're also quite happy on farmland and like semi-open habitats like the edge of a woodland. They eat small mammals almost exclusively and will use nests previously made by other species. They're not territorial, which is fairly unusual. Like the long-eared owl, the feathers on the short-eared owl's heads are not actually ears. The short-eared owl lives in open country and nests on the ground. And we don't have very many European eagle owls in the UK, but they're very big and have a slightly silly Latin name. And then the second family of owls are barn owls, one of which is the barn owl. These are quite easy to identify because they're white. Their face is shaped to gather sound like ears do. They're not woodland birds because they eat mice and shrews and voles which are easiest to hunt in open country, which they do at night with their really good hearing. And they're very well adapted for hunting in long grass, having long legs, but they're not very waterproof. This means you might see them hunting during the day if the night before was rainy, but this makes them liable to be seen and mobbed by other birds, which apparently is an actual term in which lots of smaller birds harass predators. Barn owls are very hungry, so they eat a lot of rodents. After they've had a snack, they regurgitate the bones and fur they can't digest in the form of a pellet, which they like leaving on round bales for some reason. In a nest, they use these pellets in place of a nesting material for all the baby owls, which are called owlets. I like owls. Until a few years ago, we had quite a few on the farm living in a slang of trees just over here, and you'd hear them at night making three distinct noises, hooting, screeching, and twit to I'm not an owl expert, but I think we had three different types, little owls, tawny owls, and I have seen a barn owl at the bottom of the farm a few years back. But I don't think we have any owls now, because they've been outcompeted by other predatory birds, like buzzards, which can prey directly on the smaller owl species, but the biggest problem is the red kite. Kites have been reintroduced to the British countryside by conservationists, which is something they like to pat them themselves on the back for. Here's an exhibit from the Natural History Museum in Oxford to give you a flavour. I couldn't get a good photo because it was behind glass, but I'll paste the full text on the screen. It says gamekeepers assumed kites killed game birds, which whatever your opinion on gamekeeping is, I doubt they assumed that. And by 1900 there were none in England and Scotland. Around 1990 they were reintroduced and the return of this beautiful bird is one of the great conservation successes of recent years and gives hope that with our help other species can recover. As a rule, conservationists don't like farmers because they think that we're the bad guys, but that means they don't talk to us. But if you ask any farmer, certainly around here in the Midlands, they will tell you that the reintroduction of the kite has been an ecological disaster. But this is because nature is dynamic and it's always shifting as the balance of things is pulled one way and another with the changing of the seasons and years. But but if you add another species into the mix, it can disrupt the old balance of things and have effects you have not foreseen. This principle is well established and is generally applied to invasive species. A famous example of this was the introduction of the cane toad to Australia, which was intended to control the population of cane beetles, but then quickly spread all over the place. And now Australia has yet another poisonous creature to deal with. But introducing a native species like the red kite can also have effects like this. If you change the wildlife, the wildlife is going to change. Because of the reintroduction of the kite, our farm has seen a catastrophic decline in all of the things that kites eat, which is pretty well every single small creature. I mean, buzzards are also present all of the time. You see in this shot, they're circling looking for small creatures in the grass. We used to have lots of toads particularly, but field mice, shrews, voles, frogs, they've all declined. But some of the things that used to feed on them, so we don't have any owls anymore. You only ever see kites, buzzards and rooks now, which I think is a shame. If you look at the nationwide population graphs for tawny, little and barn owls, they're all in decline, but buzzards and kites are doing the opposite. This is unlikely to be the sole cause, but it is certainly a factor. But as the conservationists say, with our help, other species can recover. So today we're going to help out the owls. This is something we've been trying to do for some time. We have two owl boxes. This one is fairly large and I understand is for tawny owls and is mounted on the gable of one of our sheds. This one is smaller and is for little owls, I believe. They have to crawl up a chute to get in. We've left some logs by it to house bugs and rodents, but there's also some litter people have kindly thrown out of their car windows. But today we shall make a box for barn owls. I think our farm is reasonably well suited for barn owls. 
They need to be able to eat small things, which like to live in rough grasslands, which we have patches of around our yard. And you may be surprised to hear they do really well in arable crop producing landscapes, which is the other land use that we have on the farm. This is because creatures live in the grass and ditches and hedges along field boundaries, but then venture out into the fields where there's not much cover to eat the crops, so it's fairly easy pickings for barn owls. If you look at a map of the barn owl's distribution, they're most populous in Lincolnshire and East Anglia, which are the areas the uninitiated might consider the worst for wildlife, as they generally don't even have hedges. That said, since the Second World War, rough grassland, which is the natural habitat of a barn owl, has declined as the land has been improved and often brought under the plough. But this is all stuff that we have near our barns. We have matted old grass and we have arable fields, and it would be useful to have owls living here because hopefully they'd control the rodents before they chewed through important things. All of this information is courtesy of the Barn Owl Trust, who have a really accessible set of resources on their website, and it is their owl box design I have based mine on. Owls will furnish their boxes with pellets, and the young will hatch inside, where ideally they will live until they're grown up. This means the box has to be quite deep, with the entrance quite high, so young owls can only jump out when they're old enough to fly. The box isn't a very complicated structure, it's just cut out of a sheet of plywood. I cut a hole in the front to allow the adult owls to come in and out, and then screwed the sides together. Just in case the young owls jump up but aren't feeling too confident yet, I added a platform beneath the hole with some battens around the edge that they can stand on and grip easily. I'm not the best carpenter in the world, but the beauty of farm building projects is that they don't have to look pretty, so you can just get on with them. The whole thing only took a little over an hour. I added a bottom and a snug but removable lid so it can be cleaned out in the future. So the box in the end is quite a simple structure. It doesn't need to be waterproof because it'll be under a barn. I think this is quite a good spot because it's easily visible from our grassland so any passing owls will hopefully notice the hole in the box and they can sit and keep an eye out for any rats in the barn. They get used to any activity so as long as they can stay out of sight they won't mind if we have some animals in here in time. I haven't mounted it yet because I'm entering it into a owl box competition for my young farmers club. Uh, I don't think it will win but it's robust. Bust. But I'll show you when it is up and hopefully when we get an owl. But next we have the problem of making the rest of the landscape owl friendly. One problem here is owls drowning in troughs, which they'll fly into for a wash or a drink but then get trapped and drown. We have one functioning square trough for which we can make a float fairly easily. That will be an evening activity when the nights draw out. But most of our troughs in the fields are these slightly bigger round ones which are slightly tapered. I have put bits of wood in them and to be fair I haven't found any drowned birds since doing that a couple of years ago but apparently it's not ideal. So if anybody has any ideas of how to make those owl proof I'm very much open to suggestions. And that's owls!